Hello and welcome. My name is Alan and today we'll be doing more Massacre at El Mazote. Yes, I am behind on videos, I know. But I am trying to catch up here. But anyway. Let's go ahead and hop back into this. The Americans had stepped forward to fund the war, but they were unwilling to fight it. It would be left to the Salvadorans to defeat the guerrillas. The guerrilla always carries his mesas into battle with him was a famous army saying of the era, a piece of received wisdom from that darkest period of the Salvadoran Civil War, and its author was Colonel Monterosa himself. It was intended not only as a statement, in fact, but as a general affirmation of principle in this bloody war. It was um, in the Red Zones. There was really no such thing as a civilian. A large professional army would have reoccupied territory and sent out aggressive patrols, all the while doing political work in the countryside to regain the loyalty of the people. Indeed, that was part of the rationale behind the search and destroy operations. There are a lot of different names for counter guerrilla fighting. Colonel Castillo, then the Vice Minister of Defense, told me in an interview. Whether they call it hammer and anvil or the piston, or something else. It's all the same idea. To try to expel guerrillas from the zone, to kick them out of all those areas where they, they'd imposed a Marxist-Leninist system. After we managed to expel them, they would lose the support of the people and they had uh, they had indoctrinated. But in those days, Castillo conceded the army didn't have enough equipment or forces to maintain operations there for a long enough time. The result was that the army would enter a zone in force. The guerrillas, after a few minor engagements, would flee, and the soldiers, after killing a number of supposed subversives, citizens who may or may not have been guerrilla supporters, but hadn't been quick enough or smart enough to uh, get out of the way, would evacuate the zone, leaving the token force behind, which the guerrillas when they flowed back in a few days later, would maul and expel. The army's tactic was not effective. Uh, few guerrillas were killed, nor was the civilian support eliminated, and it made for great frustration and eventually fear on the part of the Salvadoran high command. A mentality developed in those days, a senior Salvadoran officer told me. The army wasn't prepared for this kind of war. It wasn't trained for it. We were a small army, not very well equipped, and we were just beginning to receive U.S. aid. We knew we were going, we were given this to confront the aggression of uh, to Salvadoran society from the Marxists that we were now at the heart of the Cold War, right where these two great currents from the Soviet Union and the United States came smashing together. The result was you had an ideological overcharge here in this little country, and it didn't take much for a scenario to develop where you 
are either an enemy or a friend. If you are not with a uh, with one, you are against me. Or if you are not with me, you are against me. And if you are against me, then I have to destroy you. The mentality and the desperation that lay at the root of uh, of it set the stage for a particularly savage kind of war. When I arrived here in June of 1982, the Salvadoran officers used to brag to me that they didn't take prisoners. Colonel Cash, the military attache, said, they said, we don't want to dignify them by taking prisoners. They wouldn't even call them prisoners or guerrillas. They'd call them terroristas. Uh, delin delinquentes terroristas. Uh, General Blandon, the former chief of staff, told me bluntly, before 1983, we never took prisoners of war. As the guerrillas were reduced to the status of Terrorist delinquents, all civilians in certain zones, were reduced to the status of mesas, guerrilla supporters, or masas, and thus became legitimate targets. North of Torola, for example, it was believed that the civilians and the guerrillas were all mixed together and were indistinguishable. By late 1980, the army had begun to begun the tactic, and William Stanley, the political science professor, refers to as killing by zone. One of the first such operations took place in October and began with a staff meeting in Perquin. Colonel Castillo explained that it was necessary to stop the communist revolution and it was necessary to make an example of this place so we wouldn't have the same problem in other parts of the country. An officer who had been present at the meeting told me, he said we must take into account that the great majority of the people here here are guerrillas. So the idea was so to surround them all to create this hammer and anvil thing. Push all the people down to Via El Rosario where a huge artillery barrage would be unleashed. The city would be totally destroyed. We were going to make an example of these people. In retrospect, the operation appears to be less ambitious version of Operation Rescue, though centered on the other side of the Black Road. The military formed a large circle near a rear guard in the north, along guard along the road, and thus they encircled the zone and closed it in. Licho, the guerrilla commander, told me, we fought for 15 days, moving the population with us. We could put up a line of resistance with the population behind us, resist, then retreat. We would fight, then move them, fight, then move them. When we ran out of ammunition and supplies, we took the young people with us to be combatants, crossed the river, and left the others in El Rosario. When the soldiers finally marched into El Rosario, they killed, any num they killed a number of those people, perhaps as many as 40, according to one account, as even larger... An even larger massacre was averted partly because of disagreements among the middle-level officers involved, several of whom were counted 
whom still counted themselves as members of the orders of the hardliners. There was going to be this great artillery barrage along with sustained bombing. The former Captain Marcelo Cruz Cruz told me in an interview in Perquin. We were made uh, when we made it to the Via Rosario, we found all the people had been crowded into the church. We had a discussion among all the officers to decide what to do, whether they were to follow the high command's decision to kill all the people. What That would have been just one big massacre. Finally, Mena Sandoval Captain Francisco Emilio Mena Sandoval, another well-known progressive, radioed the commanders, told them he had captured the town and they didn't have to bomb. When they were alive, the survivors fled, having uh, leaving behind a lovely ghost town occupied only by a crotchety old man and a handful of others. The soldiers proceeded to burn all the crops they could find, setting off the first of major migrations from Morazan. Peasants fled north into the Honduran border to Colo Moncagua and the other camps in south toward the displaced persons camps that had been set up outside San Francisco Gotera. The zone had been empty, uh, had begun to empty to the army's satisfaction. If the guerrillas were fish swimming in the sea of people, as Mao had said, then the army would do its best to drain the sea. Uh, quitarle el agua al pez, as the officers put it, to take away the water from the fish. The soldiers would come in, said Nicholas Romero, an old man who stubbornly refused to leave Via Rosario, and they'd say, well, anyone who's got who's not a guerrilla has left, so the rest of the people got out because they didn't want to be accused of being guerrillas. Then the guerrillas would come and they'd say, everybody better leave because now we're going to attack the town. The only way I survived was when the guerrillas came, I was nice to them. When the soldiers came, I was nice to them. I just kept my uh, tail between my legs. Otherwise, I'd have been dead long ago. I refused to leave. My umbilical cord is buried right here in the floor. I've never left. But I thought about suicide sometimes. It was terrible all the time bombing and shooting and grenades. You'd be eating your soup and suddenly a bomb would land nearby and knock you to the floor. There was so there was no money, no crops, no food. You couldn't even go beg for food in the next village because there were no or because there were planes up there and every time they'd see people down here They'd shoot. Despite the army's success in taking away the water, however, the fish continued to multiply and grow stronger. In November of 1980, a month after the Via Rosar El Rosario operation, the guerrillas began to receive the first of a number of shipments of small arms from the Sandinista regime in Nicaragua. A mixture of uh, FALs, M16s, and Uzis, according to Stanley. 
after the collapse of the final offensive in January, the guerrillas also benefited from a fresh infusion of manpower, including not only the fighters who had fled the cities, but a number of important deserters from the army, among them Captains Cruz Cruz and Mena Sandoval, the latter of whom had succeeded on seizing and holding for a time the second brigade in Santa Ana. When the rebellion collapsed, both officers joined the guerrillas, eventually making their way to the ERP Commandantes in Morazan. It was the end of progressive movement in the Salvadoran army. In front of the Perquin uh, Health Clinic that Tuesday in early December amid the backwash from the helicopters, the men of the Atlacado mustered and made ready. The National Guardsmen who had uh, by this time had collected the ten villages pushed their reluctant charges forward through the troops until they reached a tall green-eyed officer in combat fatigues who was striding about amid the commotion, um, pointing here and there and issuing orders. One of the Perquin men who had served in the army several years before recognized the officer as Major Natividad de Jesus Cáceres Cabrera a legendary figure, six in the academy class, a born-again Christian, a fanatical anti-communist, and now the executive officer of the Atlacado Battalion. Later, his legend grew as, the, as a colonel in command of Chalat. Tenango in 1986. He forced all the residents and of that substantial city to express their desire for peace, their purity, their soul, and also their cleanliness by pointing the entire or painting the entire city white. And in 1989 on a Salvadoran highway Caceres um, ordered his men to block the convoy of the Am American ambassador, uh, William Walker, and when the ambassador refused to emerge and offer proof of his identity, threatened to blow up his limousine with anti-tank weapons. This last incident finally led the defense minister to relieve uh, Caceres of his command and send him to Chile as military attache. On that Tuesday in front of the clinic in Perquin, Major Caceres looked over the ten men and gestured to five captains who were organizing the companies under their command. He put two of us with each company, one of the Perquin men told me, and he said, we want you to come with us to show us the area. They had been brought there to serve as guides for the Atlacado. Major Caceres gathered the captains together gave the pseudonyms to be used over the radio during the operations. He himself would be known as Charlie and issued a few orders. Uh, then the five companies of the Atlacado moved out, 
down the mountainside. Everywhere above the rear of the helicopters could above the roar of the helicopters could be heard the thud of mortars and booming of artillery. It was a huge operation, the guide from Perquin told me. There were helicopters and planes and heavy equipment and troops all through the mountains and they even had animals in uh, animals to carts among some of the guns and ammunition. Though the guides didn't know it, uh, he had become a part of Operation Rescue's Hammer and Anvil. Even as the Atlacado men set off south from Perquin, hundreds of other soldiers were moving steadily north. Having been deployed as a blocking force along the Torola and Sapo rivers to the south and east and along the Black Road to the west, they were now tightening the circle. These units, the hammer of the operations, were meant to push all the guerrillas in the zone up toward the anvil of the Atlacatl and crush them against the best troops of the army had to offer. But, of course, the very size of the operation guaranteed the guerrillas would know of it far in advance and would have ample time to flee. As a lieutenant involved in all the operation, uh, operation remarked to me, you make troops from all over the country and move them up to Morazan in about 90 truckloads right along the Pan American Highway. I mean, you took somebody... You think somebody uh, might notice? As Monterosa's men circled the hills below Perquin, the guerrillas of the People's Revolutionary Army far to the south at La Guacamaya, completed their preparations. Confronted with a heavy force blocking the river to the south and the Atlacado moving down from the north, the guerrillas would break straight west, punching their way through the line, uh, military's lines at the Black Road. That night, some of their trains started to tra started the trek. Uh, long columns of peasants, their belongings, food, and young children bundled on their backs, trudged single file through the mountains, flowing to a vast nocturnal exodus that would carry them over the mountains to the Honduran border. In the morning on, of Wednesday, December the 9th, while thick mists still carpeted the valleys, the men of the 3rd Company of the Atlacadal rose in their encampment on a hill called El Gigante, or El Gigante, uh, broke camp and circled back toward the Black Road. In the hamlet of La Tejera that afternoon, they seized uh, three civilians, two youths, and an old man of 80 or more, hustled uh, them along in a field not far from the sawmill and began interrogating them very strongly, very brutally, according to the guide from Perquin. The officers accused the men of being guerrillas, demanded to be given the names of their comrades, to be told where they had hidden their weapons. When the men denied the charges, Major Cacares declared that they would be executed. The killing, he said, would begin here. 
But then a farmer from the area came forward. The two youths worked for him. He towed the major, and he protested vigorously that they had nothing to do with the gorillas. One of the guides vouched for them as well, and after a prolonged dispute, the men were spared. This argument over identity, over who was a gorilla and who wasn't, and what constituted evidence one way or the other would uh, recur during the next two days. Already in La Tejera, officers disagreed about whether the men should have been spared according to the guide. Captain Walter Oswaldo Salazar, the company commander, reacted angrily when he was told of a comment from another officer that the local people should be treated with respect unless there was evidence that they were gorillas. Salazar said, No, these are all gorillas, the guide said. He said the soldiers could go ahead and kill any of them and, or all of them. Later that day, according to the guide, Captain Salazar let slip his suspicion that the other officer was in fact a gorilla himself and vowed to assassinate him. This wasn't simply paranoia. We had tremendous infiltration in the army at that time, the lieutenant involved in the operation told me. We knew that certain sales of arms were going to these people. That information was being leaked. All our operations, all our movements were being leaked. The overwhelming suspicion that this engendered, together with the growing panic among the officers that the destruction of the government position gave the hardest line officers a decisive upper hand. The hardcore guys uh, there really did believe that it was a virus and infection, uh, Todd Greentree said. They always say a... Uh, cancer, you know. Communism is a cancer. And so, if you're a gorilla, they don't just kill you. They kill your cousin. You know everybody in your family to make sure the cancer is cut out. These officers, of course, had Salvadoran history on their side. They had to kill a seed mentally. Professor Stanley told me, after all, what happened in 1932. To this day, when someone wants to make a threat, here they, uh, why do they invoke the name of Martinez, the author of Matanza? Because he is an icon, that's why. The idea of going out to the zones and killing everyone is not a new idea. It's a proved idea. Putting that proved idea into practice would become the mission of the Atlacado Battalion, hoping to ensure that at least one unit of the Salvadoran Army was adequately prepared to fight the Americans sent special forces uh, instructors in early 1981 to train the first recruits of the new Immediate Reaction Infantry Battalion, BIRI. Yet, the American advisors well knew the epithet of elite American trained that was, um, that was hung on the Atlacado by the press was a bit of a joke. They had no specialized training. One of the original Special Forces trainers told me they had 
basic individualized training, you know, basic shooting, marksmanship, squad tactics. I mean, the difference was that the Salvadorans basically had no trained units in the country, so this was going to be a union unit that was trained. Some officials in the embassy and the Pentagon had wanted the entire unit to be trained in the United States, and indeed, later in the year, recruits for the second of these, uh, for the second of the BIRIs, the Bayosa would be flown en masse to Fort Bragg, North Carolina. But the Atlacado had something the Bayoso didn't. It had Monterosa. That the battalion wasn't uh, that the battalion wasn't sent to the United States, but was trained by Monterosa here was in large part a testament to his authority. The contemporary of Monterosa's told me the high command had been preparing him, grooming him. He had taken all the courses the American offered, or Americans offered, including those for the paratroopers and the commandos. His ambition became very concrete around the time the Americans decided to direct a major counterinsurgency effort here. When the Atlacado came along, he jumped at it. From the beginning, Monterosa worked to give his new force a mystica, a mystique. They shot animals and smeared the blood all over their faces. They slid open the animals' bellies and drained the blood. A lieutenant in the in another unit told me. They were a hell of a, a raunchy unit. They had no di discipline of fire, none at all. I mean, they saw something moving out there, they shot it. Deer, pigs, whatever. You'd be out there in the field trying to sleep, and all night those assholes would keep shooting at things. According to one reporter, the men of the Atlacado celebrated their graduation by collecting all the dead animals they could find off the roads, dogs, vultures, anything, boiling, boiling them together into a bloody soup and chugging it down. Then they stood at rigid attention and sang full-throated the unit's theme song, Somos Guerreros. We are warriors. Warriors all. We were going forth to kill a mountain of terrorists. By the fall of 1981, Atlacado was well on its way to building that mountain. The pattern of the operations had become well known. Units of the regular army and the security forces would move into place along the border of one of the red zones, walling it off with the help very often of a natural barrier like the river zone pushing before it, everyone and everything living. Finally, the helicopters would sweep in and the men of the Atlacado could storm out uh, bombard all who had, all whom had, uh, whom the trap had snared with artillery and mortar fire and then with small arms. But yeah, we'll go ahead and end this chapter here. It's already 35 minutes in. But yeah, um, we see a lot going on here. They have this one page, they have a picture. It says, The soldiers of the Atlacado Battalion, an elite Salvadoran Army unit, trained by U.S. Special Forces instructors and commanded by Lieutenant Colonel Domingo Monterroso. And they have an actual 
image here. Yeah. But we see that even though there was little training given to this force, that's still more training than any other military force or battalion had at the time. And they were also more vicious. And unfortunately, we see between the two sides, the ones that suffer, the citizens. They're just trying to live their everyday life. But you got one side, we're revolutionaries against the government. And the other side, which is backed by American money and weapons and a little bit of American training is like death to the communists and it's like really why oh gotta fight communism though get capitalism going yeah you look at the way capitalism is in modern uh, in the modern world it isn't any better many Americans are dying because of it because they can't afford what communism or capitalism calls for you know have more money but all the money's going to just a handful of sources. It's like it's all being sucked up in a vacuum. Yeah. But, again, it is, it's the everyday citizens. You know, the, the, the poor and the lower class those who are just trying to make a living it's talking about the difficulty of finding food that some couldn't even go and trade for food because if you tried to travel to the next town over to try to trade for food you'd be shot at so again these are people just trying to survive and they're the casualties in this war We'll go ahead and end this episode here. As always, educate thyself. Think, read, study, learn. Someone tries to tell you something you have trouble believing, ask them to cite their sources. I appreciate y'all for watching. I'll see you all in the next video. Until then, later.